Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. So we are taking a break from our regularly scheduled programming for a special guest episode today. This is the first time that I have ever done one of these, where I was the host, but I think it turned out well. On episode 71, we discussed love, sex, and prostitution in ancient Greece, and so I thought it would be really neat to bring on a friend of the show and fellow podcaster herself, Avon McMaster, to also discuss love, sex, and prostitution, but from the Roman perspective. That's because in addition to being co-host of the Endless Knot podcast, Avon is an assistant professor in ancient studies at Thornalo University at Laurentian, which is in Ontario, Canada, for those who didn't know. She's primarily a Latinist, especially late Republican and Augustan age poetry, and she often teaches courses on sex and the body in the ancient world. So she was the perfect person to bring onto the show for this topic, and unsurprisingly, we had an excellent, informative, and might I say hilarious conversation. All right, and joining me today is Ava McMaster, uh, one of the co-hosts for the Endless Knot podcast. Uh, Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So Avon is on today, and we're going to discuss some of the striking differences between Greece and Rome and some of the things that they're similar in terms of sexuality and prostitution and things that they compare and contrast. So uh, first thing we're going to talk about is pederasty. And as you guys listened to from my previous episode, uh, you know that it was a very foundational in ancient Greece, but I'm curious to see what role, if any, that it played in ancient Rome. So for that, uh, we have Avon here today, and she is an expert in Roman sexuality. So it's going to be interesting to compare and contrast some of the things. So uh, Avon, what ways are they similar and what ways are they different? Well, the very first thing is that pederasty as an institution, the way you talked about it in Greece, really didn't exist at Rome. So the idea of freeborn boys having sexual relations with an older man and having that be acceptable just didn't exist. So that's the really big striking difference. The idea of having sex with boys certainly existed at Rome. And the idea that you would find young boys attractive, so we're talking again boys, um, it's always a little hard to tell what the lower age limit is, but maybe 12, 13 as your lower age limit, up to 18, 19, 20, uh, the upper age limit was just like in Greece, when they started to develop hair on their body, Uh, beard was the marker of, of coming to the end of your attractiveness. So the idea that that kind of a boy was attractive was absolutely normal in Rome as well. The key difference was the identity of the beloved, of the youth. And in Greece, you have this whole institution where aristocratic and maybe middle class boys intentionally sought out lovers, and there was this pedagogical as as well as pederastic relationship. But at Rome, no freeborn boy was eligible for such a uh, relationship. If a boy at any point played the passive recipient or was the Aramanos or the beloved, that was a mark of disgrace for him that he could never outgrow. So it was complete and it was illegal as well. It was you know, both societally and legally not allowed. So you're saying that in Rome, it was kind of a, I don't want to say tacit, but it was kind of something that was in their social system, but it wasn't like an institutional type of affair. It was in the fabric of their society. Not exactly. It was more that it was openly practiced, but the boy was a slave. Ah, Okay. So it wasn't between two citizens. Gotcha. No, it wasn't between two citizens. So boys, having boys as sexual objects was common. I mean, exactly how common, we can't know for sure, but it was certainly common, normal, accepted, but the boy would be a slave. And whereas in Greece, while there were slave prostitutes who were boys, which you talked about, uh, there was also this institution of free boys who would be your beloved. And that is what was missing from the Roman peace. And while probably it did happen sometimes that freeborn boys were in, let's say, homosexual relationship of some kind with an older or a a same age other man, if that did happen, it had to be kept a complete secret. And even the possibility of that, even just the accusation of that could be in any way plausible, could be enough to ruin a man's career. Do we have any um, 
famous examples of where that may have ruined a man's career in ancient Rome or a famous like, uh, you know, we get all sorts of legal speeches in ancient Greece about, and that's where we get a lot of our information. It may not be true. It may be, you never know. Do we have anything from Cicero, for example, or any sort of like uh, special circumstances that we can draw upon? Well, we do. Now, it's immediately going to seem to prove my words false in that the accusations, we do have a bunch of accusations, and none of them that we have really did ruin the man's career. But I think that's because in most of the cases where we have this kind of an accusation, uh, the man was in a very special circumstance. So, the famously, Julius Caesar, during the triumph, which is the big parade that a successful Roman general is awarded, his soldiers march along and it's a time when they're allowed to say really rude things. And traditionally, they would sing rude songs about their commander. And we're told that he was called the Queen of Bithynia and told, said to be every woman's man and every man's woman by his soldiers. So, I mean, that's an accusation. And the Queen of Bithynia is a reference to early on, he was off in Bithynia at the court of the King Nicomedes and was rumored to have been in a sexual relationship with him and to be the boy to the king. Did it have something to do because he was in the, the Greek East, per se, that, that uh, those accusations might have came about? Mm -hmm. So I'll get to that in a moment, but absolutely, there's a strong association with the Greek customs and the East with all of this. So Caesar was definitely accused of it, but it didn't ruin his career. But as I say, I mean, he's an exceptional circumstance. Nothing ruined his career. <laughs> and then also from Cicero in particular, we do have accusations. He accuses Catiline, his great arch rival, who had sort of an uprising riot slash coup planned in Rome. And he accuses Catiline of having been free with his favors as a boy. And famously, he accuses Antony, Mark Antony, in his Philippics towards the end of his life. Um, after the death of Caesar, he rails against Antony and he calls him everything under the sun. And he says that in his youth, he was actually married to another man who dressed him in a matrona's stola in a woman's dress and kept him as his wife uh, when he was young. Do we know if these um, accusations had any weight behind them or if they were just like name calling? We don't really know. I mean, the possibility that Antony was sort of openly acknowledged to be in some kind of relationship at some point is there. When I say that it was the sort of thing that was deeply scandalous, we have to remember that in every society, there are people who do things that are acknowledged as deeply scandalous. But as long as they are wealthy enough or noble enough and everyone kind of winks and nods, it happens anyway. And we don't have a lot of access to that because all we really will hear is rumors. It's not the sort of thing we'll ever have a good you know, source for. Like, how could we know? If there is such a system, no one's ever going to write it down because that's the whole point. <laughs> it's tacit. So maybe, I mean, in the same speeches, he accuses him of being a drunkard and a gambler and a whoring himself out and coming into the Senate house and vomiting in his lap and every possible thing he can think of. If you ever want to learn better ways of insulting someone, go read the Philippics. They're <laughs> masterpieces of invective. It's a way to improve your Latin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I don't know whether they're true. Um, I wouldn't put anything past Antony necessarily, but I also wouldn't put anything past Cicero. In the same way that in Greece, accusing somebody of having been a prostitute, being paid for his favors, right, is the thing that they say that like it's okay to be a beloved and take gifts, but if you're seen to be mercenary, then that's crossing a line. So everybody's accused of that in court in a way to try to blacken their name. That's the sort of thing that happens in Rome with the idea of being a canidus, which is the word they use for somebody who is the recipient in a homosexual relationship and worse, likes it. That's the worst possible thing you could be accused of in Rome. Conversely, in that sort of a relationship, even if the boy is free, which is technically a stupor, which means sexual violence or sexual crime. If you accost a, a freeborn boy, it's a crime. Even so, the person who does it, the older man, there's really no shame attached to him. I mean, he could be up for legal prosecution if the boy's father sues him. But in terms of sort of shame and in terms of what his sexual role is, there's no problem. Is that sort of like in uh, Greece, the legal definition of hubris? 
Yeah, it's very similar. There, I mean, there's there's slight differences in terms of how it's applied, but yeah, hubris and stuprum are equivalent anyhow. There's also something called moikia, which is adultery specifically, which is when you sleep with a woman who's married. And those are both illegal in some form or another, or at least something that somebody could sue you for. Yeah, adultery in, in ancient Greece is quite interesting. I'm curious as to had any interesting rituals in ancient Rome. Well, the idea of being able to kill the lover if you find them, there's similar sorts of ideas, but we don't have any court cases of it actually happening in Rome, to my knowledge, unlike the famous court case that we have preserved in Greece of uh, Eratosthenes, I think, who killed um, his wife's lover. I think there are laws under which that was allowed, but we don't have good evidence of it actually happening, to my knowledge. So there's nothing like the Raditatio or (laughs) any of that sort of stuff? (laughs) Well, there seem to be some sort of ideas that these things are possible. But what seems to have happened in practice is if there was adultery, you could accuse the other man and you could get a punishment, like a fine, essentially, from him. And you had to divorce your wife if you accused her of adultery. That seems to be quite common in what I found in doing my research for these episodes. Since our sources are male and they're upper class, basically a lot of it's philosophical treatises or legal speeches. It's kind of like, how do you determine what's the ideology of what the society should be and what's actually in practice? And, and, and going further, what's actually in practice with the lower classes as opposed to the upper classes? That's a really big thing. Like when we talk about sexuality at Rome, um, again, we're talking about upper classes, we're talking about ideology, we're talking about the sort of what you say as opposed to what you do. What we have in terms of what people might have actually done is we have all of the salacious gossip and the accusations. But of course, that goes the other way too. You know, gossip is no more real than grave inscriptions. They have an agenda. And so when Suetonius is telling us stories about the emperors and their many perversions, he's just as much sort of activating what the ideals were at Rome and then saying, well, the emperor is a bad emperor. So to prove that, I'm going to tell you all these stories about his sexual perversions. And since we all know that when sexual activity is a true reflection of your inner morality, you will then understand that this is a bad emperor. He doesn't say that explicitly, but that's what's going on. So all the stories about Tiberius or Caligula or Nero and and their, you know, sexual perversions, they tell us a lot about what is seen as unacceptable by the Romans, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what he, they were actually doing. Yeah, not necessarily the emperors, what was actually common and not. It was what, if you did it, you were basically looked down upon. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. What would be a source of shame? And then we also have this problem, the major problem of, of what were the non-aristocratic, non-upper class people doing? And how did they think? We have some tantalizing, interesting little bits of glimpses of that in Rome with things like the graffiti on the walls of Pompeii. Uh, So we have a few places where we have a bit of an an idea of what people were actually doing and the brothels and things like that in, in Pompeii, though there was a time when they thought that every third house in Pompeii was a brothel because they had sexual imagery on the walls. But it's been revised and we now think that a lot of normal houses had sexual imagery on the walls which is a whole other interesting (laughs) insight. So basically the Pompeians were a kinky folk. Well, I think all Romans probably were. We just only have Pompeii, right? Because it's preserved and wall paintings aren't preserved very much elsewhere. But yeah, I think in some ways it's different than what you'd expect now. In other ways, if you went into an upper class house and you saw like a Rubens or a Renaissance painting on the wall with a naked woman being carried off by Zeus... You wouldn't be like, oh my goodness, in this house, people go around naked and are uh, having sex with animals. Clearly, what happens in this home, right? It's art. And there's, in fact, you know, much more modern versions of, of art with nudity and other stuff in it that doesn't tell you what happens in the house. There used to be a sort of a reading of the walls as if people painted on the walls what they expected to do in that room. Because sometimes it does seem to be you have dining rooms with dining scenes painted on them. Okay. But... You know, you have to be a little careful not to be too literal about that. Yeah, I remember when I visited Pompeii, the tour guide was every place we stopped, they basically made a point like, this is the menu for this house. And I was like, well, maybe. (laughs) But at the same time, like, if it's that prevalent, do you really need to have an image to show you what to do? Yeah, some of the houses, some of the buildings in Pompeii with like only small little rooms that are not very fancy and that have like one sexual, completely explicit picture in every room. All right, I think we can talk about brothels there. 
But in other clearly villas and other places, there's also sexual activity happening on the walls. And I really don't think those were fancy brothels. You know, I think they were just homes. But I'm not an expert on Pompeii. I just know that they've kind of done some reinterpreting over the years. And there certainly is a, a prevalence of sexual imagery. And you also have all of the graffiti in Pompeii. Of and One of the things it tends to suggest is that, for instance, women may have gone to prostitutes sometimes, to male prostitutes, uh, which is not something you would have any sense could have ever happened, really, if you look at the idealizing literature. But there is some love poetry that kind of suggests that, that rich women could have access to boys and pay them with gifts and boys and men. And that they traded them around and they used gladiators for such services, for instance. We get a lot of that in Marshall about how much the women love the gladiators. Juvenile is very angry about that. Um, so, you know, the ideology of how women acted would say that could never happen. But we have some indications that, yeah, just like at any age, when they have a certain amount of freedom, rich women could do what they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get that in Greece too. I, I forget the source right now off the top of my head, but I know there was a few sources about like male gigolos, but like they definitely were uh, not the ideology of the elite upper class women who were supposedly secluded in their homes and not able to move out and about so they wouldn't have had access to a lot of that type of services that the men typically would have. But I'm sure it happened. What's in practice might not be the vast majority, but I'm sure cases of it happened. Yeah, exactly. And in comparison to Greece, anyway, upper class women had so much more freedom to leave the house, to do what they wanted, to own their own, has to live on their own. I mean, things that upper class Athenian women anyway, would never have had an option to do really. So it's not surprising that they had some fun. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that Roman women had much more freedom to move about as opposed to Greek women. I actually, in one of my episodes, I did talk about that, how women, the ideology, they were secluded. You have that famous oration by Pericles where the best Athenian women are unseen and unknown, sort of. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. I can't think of it off the top of my head at the moment. But So that wasn't the case with Romans. Could you elaborate on that more? Yeah, I mean, to a certain extent, there's a similarity in that women were definitely not supposed to be part of public life in a large way. They weren't supposed to be part, you know, they couldn't vote. They couldn't uh, take part in government. But at least for the upper classes, and again, we really can't talk much about the lower classes, the idea they weren't really kept in seclusion. There's very much a sense of that they went about and went out and did their visiting. And men, of course, had you know the big public role. But we actually have lots of evidence from the late Republic onward, and it's probably, well, in fact, even from the Middle Republic, of the important presence of women in sort of implicit ways in public life. So you have things like the mothers of, of politicians were important. Most famous is the mother of the Gracchi, the uh, Cornelia Gracchus, whose sons, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, were these really important politicians. And she becomes this figure who, oh, her sons were more precious than jewels to her and, and then kept pushing them to be the greatest statesmen of their time. So while she wasn't herself in the public life, she had this really important influence and she would have people, even after they were both murdered, <laughs> that's what public life was in the Middle Republic, in the late Republic in Rome, each of them was murdered by senators. But they, uh, after they died, she spent the next, you know, until she died, which was quite a long time later, having dinner parties with all of the best known men in Rome and having lots of scholarly and intellectual salons, basically. So she was not in any way reclusive. And then later on, you have many female figures, even before the empire, who clearly lived lives that were pretty much independent. Rome had a lot of divorce and remarriage because divorce was very easy and there was no major stigma attached to it, usually, unless it was because of uh, infertility, because, because marriages were used for political purposes, right? So you'd divorce and remarry every time you had somebody else you wanted to make a connection with. And... Once women had been married, after that point, they were kind of on their own. They could marry again and often did, but they didn't always go back to their father's place and they had their own dowry. They were upper class Roman women were allowed to own property. They could manage their own affairs. Technically, for legal reasons, they had to have somebody who was 
could go to court on their behalf because they couldn't go to court. But other than that, they could pretty much run their own lives if they had enough money to do so. So that's very different than Greece, at least than Athens. And it meant that they seem to have had a fairly important behind the scenes role. And they also could have like a real social life. <laughs> they could have female and male friends that weren't their relatives, and they did. And then we also see in the late Republic and onward, and especially under the empire. So once you get emperors, you also have empresses, right? You have the imperial family. And that really changes the role of women in public because like any monarchy, once you have queens and princesses, you have a sort of a model for a woman with power who's got a public persona. Even Octavia, Octavian's sister, who's the first, you know, Octavian becomes Augustus, the first emperor. She's a public figure. Her children and herself are publicly sort of held up to pity because she's been abandoned by Mark Antony. And so she's one of the reasons that Augustus, or Octavian as he was, could go and declare war on Antony because poor Octavia has been abandoned. So, you know, they have a public role even if they can't go vote and they can't be magistrates. And then we also have lots of examples of them as um, benefactors. They can give money to you know, set up statues and build temples and do all the things that men did, usually on a lesser scale because they weren't as wealthy on their own usually. And then people would put up, you know, plaques to them, thanking them for their patronage. So we even have patrons, women being patrons, which is etymologically amusing because patron is from father. So, you know, it, it shows that they had a, a role, even if it wasn't as big a public role as the men. And that wasn't really transgressive necessarily. Yes, the ideal Roman woman was sort of a stay at home, but it was just openly acknowledged that as long as they weren't doing things that were seen as detrimental to the state or immodest, of course, if you leave the home a lot and you have men over for dinner, it opens you up to the charge that you're immodest and that your you know, adultery or whatever is going on. But doing those things in and of itself wasn't seen as a problem. So they, they definitely differ quite significantly from at least the ideology of classical Greece, or classical Athens, I should say, who, at least if you go by what the philosophers and the um, wall court speeches say, they basically had their own quarters, they did their weaving, they managed the household. When men were over, they hid in their quarters. They weren't allowed to make transactions more than a medimnos, so basically like vegetables and grain for like four or five days. They had their own dowries, but like it was always controlled by a male in the sense that like if they got divorced, they had to go back to their old house. So like it's an interesting uh, comparison. Um, I wish we had more information about other societies. Yeah, I mean, we have Sparta, but I mean, they're so much different than Athens. So probably like you have the two extremes and then everybody else is in the middle or somewhere in the middle, not necessarily smack dab in the middle, but... Yeah, it is. It's frustrating because I suspect that there was at least somewhat of a range in terms of how women fit into the society in other plays, but we just don't have that evidence. Yeah, I mean, Cicero's wife, for instance, very famously, and because we have all of his letters, we know a lot about her that we wouldn't know about other women. She had her own dowry and she had her own property and she managed it. And he would, you know, he would occasionally, she would loan him money from time to time when he needed money to do something at, you know, with interest, like a proper loan, and he would borrow money from her and then he would pay her back. So very clearly their finances were separate. You know, they didn't have a joint bank account, <laughs> basically. And she had full control over her own property and she had her own slaves and he had his own slaves. And, and yet they were a very happily married couple for 30 years. I mean, they divorced eventually, but they seem to have been for most of that time. It was not because there was anything wrong with that relationship. It was just seen as normal. She had her property, he had his, and they worked jointly together to increase both their property and to be, you know, good to one another. But she was certainly not being ruled by him financially in any way. So circling back a bit, let's talk about the social institutions that Rome had instead of pederasty. Because you know how in ancient Greece, pederasty was something that was institutionalized into their education. So how was it with Rome? The Athenian youths got their basic education, and around the age of 12 or so, they went off to the gymnasia, and they started doing advanced education, and started shadowing, like an internship, with an older male. They learned from them what they must do to be a proper citizen, and that mentorship was kind of the whole point of the pederastic relationship. How was it like then in ancient Rome? How was a male's upbringing then in the public sense? <laughs> 
also I should mention the um, idea that pederasty, as the Romans saw it, was a Greek institution. So, like, I said that it was fine for Romans to find boys attractive, and it was for most of the time. But the really old-fashioned Romans thought that this was something that we'd imported from the Greeks. It came to us from the Greeks. So, the idea of it was sort of always a little bit Eastern. And in particular, the idea uh, that freeborn boys would be involved was very Greek. And the reason that's relevant to education is because from Middle Republic onward, really, most of the educators were Greeks. So boys would be taught in schools, much like in Greece, uh, taught you know basic literacy, basic math, how to read, that sort of stuff, up till age 10, 11, something like that. And then they would have more education, again, in a school, usually, or with a private tutor. And those tutors and teachers were very often Greek slaves or freedmen. So that was very common that they were being taught by slaves or freedmen, and very, very commonly that they were Greek. And so one of the things that Roman fathers were very worried about was that their boys would be debauched by those teachers. This is where the one of the reasons for the system of the pedagogue. So this happened in Greece as well, and it's a Greek word, but Romans would send a slave whose job it was to bring the boy to school, watch over him, and then bring him back. So the pedagogue was not the teacher. We've turned it into a word for teaching now, but it wasn't the teacher. It was the slave whose job it was to protect the boy against any advances, shall we say, by the teacher. And also to watch for him, you know, on his way there and back, because Rome was always a bit dangerous. But, and people were very concerned about it. Now, whether that means that a lot of teachers were, you know, abusing their boys or not, I don't know. But it was definitely a concern. It was definitely a societal worry that this was when they were very vulnerable to their teachers. And so you had to make sure that, because as I said, like any suspicion that such a thing had happened, even as a boy, was a big deal. So you had to be able to point to them and say, this boy was never out of this, you know, his pedagogue's gaze. He was safe. You cannot say for that he was ever vulnerable to any kind of advances. And so they would get taught by in groups by these teachers. And then when they got to 17, 18, 19, um, some of them might go off to Greece for a little while to do um, advanced education and rhetoric, for instance. So they'd go to various of the schools at Athens in particular to learn philosophy or learn to speak, or they might do that at Rome. And then they would do very similar to what the pederastic relationship was, but without the sexual part, at least notionally. Um, there would be what they called, the word was tiro, T-I-R-O, or tyro in Latin, um, sort of like an apprenticeship. And it meant you spent a year, usually a year to two years with some friend of your father's who was already working in the law courts and in government. You'd follow him around and you'd learn how to speak in court and you'd learn how to do governmental duties. And maybe you'd go to a province with him. And then you'd also spend a year or two as a recruit in, in doing army training. So you'd do the same thing. And if you were lower class, you'd just go and be a soldier. If you were upper class, you'd go and like shadow an officer and learn how to be an officer. So at this point, were these young Romans, they were in their late teens, like they would have been considered adults? Late teens or early 20s. So that differs from Greece a little bit in that like most of their education was a little bit younger and then they had to go through the process and then at around age 18, then they became official citizens and then they went through their military training and usually at that point they were well, adults. Well, yeah, it's a little hard to tell. It doesn't seem to have been a sort of a fixed year. Some boys probably did it earlier, some did not as early. It may have depended on whether there were, you know, active wars on that they needed to go fight in or not. But the, about age 16 or so was when a Roman boy became a man. He would put on his toga virilis, manly toga. And from that point on, he'd pretty much be an adult, though it's not clear when he could start voting. A little bit contentious as to whether that was at 16 or 18 or exactly what that was. Um, so he was a man from that point on, but there was a lot of education to do. You know, they had all of Greek to learn as well, right? <laughs> It's like it's always been true for us Latinists. Hellenists just need to learn Greek. Latinists need to learn Greek and Latin. <laughs> so obviously we always have to work harder than those little Hellenists do. <laughs> so it was a bit true for the Romans too, in some ways. There was a you know a fairly substantial body of stuff to, to learn, so it took them a little longer. Now that you're an adult, now you go off and you do adult things and that's fine. 
the reason that the Romans were so concerned about this, like, oh my goodness, has the boy been debauched? I keep using that word, but it's just, it's such a useful word. <laughs> Keeps it clean, but it, we all know what it means. It's because the Romans had very similar ideas to sort of the Greeks about what made a man a man. The big difference was that the Greeks felt that when you were a boy, certain things were permissible that were not permissible to an adult male, whereas the Romans felt those things were not permissible to a citizen male, regardless of age. But otherwise, they're pretty much the same approach, which is basically you have to be the active member of any sexual encounter. You have to be the one putting something into somebody else. Your body has to be completely impenetrable and under your own control. And crucially for the Romans, you have to be the one taking pleasure and you certainly should not be the one giving pleasure. So in terms of sexuality, those were the sort of fundamental things that made a man a man, which meant that, you know, he could have sex with whoever he wanted to have sex with as long as he was having sex with them and they were being had. I remember reading somewhere um, when I was looking up research for ancient Greece and sexual positions for the episode, and they were talking about like for the ancient Romans, it was basically like any time a woman was on top, and that was like not a Roman thing to do. It was always like one position. It was always, you had to do it from a certain way. It was considered not beneath being a Roman if because you gave pleasure to the female or the male, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's a little unclear. I mean... I think there's some ideological elements that would agree to that. Now, if you look at those wall paintings in Pompeii, that's not what you would get from that. Um, you get a lot of women on top. You get a lot of sort of visual. But it's hard to know if that's a reflection of actual practice or if it's like porn today. You know, when you film porn, you do it in such a way that all the exciting bits are on view. And when you're going to do a painting of people having sex, what do you want to see? You want to see the the erotic bits of the woman. And so you'll make sure you can see those bits. And that's not going to necessarily be the same position as to how it would give pleasure to the man, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Could it also be that prostitutes were not considered to enjoy it no matter what? So it didn't matter what position was the encounter with the prostitute? It might be. Yeah. I mean, it's very clear what the power relationship is when it's a prostitute. So that's not really a problem. Um, yeah. You don't need to really worry too much about it. Though, that said, cunnilingus was very frowned upon for the Romans as well as was um, oral sex of any sort. So oral sex was just the absolute worst thing you could do as a man, either to a man or to a woman. It made your mouth unpure. It made your mouth dirty, polluted. And to a Roman man, his mouth was his citizenship much like for a uh, Greek, but the Romans were very, very focused on that. And to go and speak in the Senate house with a mouth that was dirtied like that would just be the greatest sacrilege and shame you could possibly imagine. So was it sacrilege or was there an actual law that made it illegal? No, I don't think there was ever a law about oral sex. I think it was so utterly filthy and taboo that it wouldn't be now it was taboo but that doesn't mean we don't we have images from pompeii of men performing it for instance and we have a good number of poems that accuse other men of giving oral sex usually to men but also to women and so it is bandied about as a big insult but it's a big insult so i wouldn't say it was necess there was no law against it it was just real bad and in somehow you were being, even if you gave it to a woman, you were being penetrated somehow by her horrors. <laughs> 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 Sorry. The ancient world is yeah. you know, full of misogyny, of course. I mean, there's no, <laughs> this is not, this is no surprise to anyone. And the Romans were just as much a misogynistic patriarchal society as the Greeks were, you know, on a, on a base level. So the woman's private parts were dirty and disgusting. And that's just obvious because obviously they were. And, uh, you know, the most interesting and attractive thing about a woman is her butt, just like it was for the Greeks. That's the thing that's described as beautiful. And that's the erotic thing for both boys and women all the time. It's their rear ends. Um, that's what everybody cares about. Their breasts were really not that important at all. Breasts were supposed to be small and high and somewhat bound often, but butts were supposed to be big and round and not hairy. <laughs> <laughs> 
of course that's the ideology and not necessarily how it was for everybody <laughs> that yeah, as in today exactly i'm sure there were people who had their own preferences but you know sexual preferences are very much shaped by society as well so you know i'm sure to a certain extent it was true but yeah exactly what positions they did what and we certainly have them describing different positions and the one with woman on top was often called the horse rider because she was riding but what was important it wasn't it wasn't that it wasn't, it wasn't okay that a woman might enjoy herself but the most important thing was that you did and that you didn't care if she did, if you see what I mean. So in ancient Greece, uh, there was both female and male prostitution and they had different categories. You had the poor and I, obviously, who were the brothel prostitutes. And then you had middle class attire and then upper class one. Was there a structure kind of like that in ancient Rome as well? And if so, how are they differentiated? The short answer is yes, basically. There were different kinds of prostitutes. The longer answer is that I don't know the specifics of it very well, and I don't know if there were regulated specifics, you know, if there were different classes. I know that prostitutes were taxed and legal, so prostitution was perfectly legal, and it was taxed as a good source of revenue. Uh, most prostitutes, but not all, were slaves, so mostly they were owned by someone who was the one who was making the money. But as you got up to a kind of classier type of prostitute, you would be mainly perhaps talking about freed women and freed men, I suppose, but the classier ones we tend to hear mostly about women. So that is women who were slaves, but not anymore, but probably still owed some duties to their former masters. So they might still work for somebody or they might work for themselves. And that's where you get to kind of the mistress category, the idea of women who were mainly kept by one man at a time, perhaps, and got either actual sort of monetary salary or relied on gifts from their lovers. That's the phrasing that we see in love poetry a lot, is that they get gifts and that they're mercenary for wanting so many gifts and they have to be expensive gifts. So that kind of prostitute is known often as a meritrix, as opposed to the more lower class prostitute with a uh, scortum. But so neither of those would be a nice name to call a woman who was respectable. But a meritrix was the kind of term for somebody who would be closer to a mistress. A scortum would be standing on the street corner or in a brothel. Uh, there was a rule that prostitutes of the street walking type had to, after a certain point, there was a law passed that they had to wear a toga to mark them out as not respectable, that they weren't respectable women and therefore there was no penalty attached to doing anything to them sexually or otherwise, frankly. So prostitution was common and accepted and male prostitutes all to a lesser extent, but also available boys. And again, usually almost, all, well, entirely slaves, really, at least notionally. And uh, we have people like, you know, famous sayings like Cato, who we're told Cato, the elder, famous moralist and censor, uh, on encountering a young man coming out of a brothel, congratulated him on being wise and restraining his appetites by going to the brothel to make sure he didn't do anything he shouldn't. But upon meeting him several more times coming out of the brothel, censored him and said he shouldn't. It was fine to do it a little bit, but too much was immoderate. So that's, you know, apocryphal, that's not the point, but that was sort of the idea that it was good to frequent prostitutes if that meant that you weren't going to go and debauch freeborn girls and boys. But on the other hand, any good Roman man should keep his appetites under control, not be too given into it. One of my favorite things about uh, reading Plotus was uh, a lot of the stock prostitute carriers um, and like the situations that they would get into. It just gives me a sense of like how common that might have been. When you see things in comedy, it might not be true, but at least it would be recognizable. So we have in Greece, the Piraeus was a, a red light district, so to speak, and Nocritus was pretty famous for their prostitutes in Corinth. Outside of Rome and Pompeii, were there any areas in Italy or Sicily or any of the other areas that were like known for their prostitutes or do we just don't have evidence on that? I don't know for sure. The only thing I would say is that Ostia, which is the port town, the harbor town, just ways down from Rome, much like the Piraeus was as a harbor town always is definitely was somewhere where you could go if you wanted. But I don't think that I know of any place in particular that was more well known for its prostitutes than anywhere else. I think they were pretty much in every city. 
<laughs> just common everywhere but that does make sense about ostia which is a very nice place to visit if you ever get the chance that was one of the day trips when i was in rome that i enjoyed i mean i really liked pompeii but like it was not that many people at ostia and pompeii was just swarming with but i digress <laughs> <laughs> that is yeah that is under visited i've heard the other thing i was going to say is that the other important element of course is that you also didn't have to go to a prostitute if you had slaves. So slaves were, at least legally, completely fair game. And that was normal. It was assumed that one of the things you might buy slaves for was that they could also be sexual objects. Uh, in particular, pretty boys were often used to serve dinner and would also be an object of attention for you and your guests. And one of the common reasons to free a female slave was to marry her. And there was a law, in fact, that if a woman was freed in order to marry her former master, she couldn't refuse. So she had to marry him. That definitely differs from Greece. I mean, obviously, uh, masters had sex with their slaves, and the male masters with their female slaves, and their male slaves, I guess, is possible as well. But you get evidence of some of the speeches where it kind of seemed like, it, not that it was taboo, but it was kind of like, it wasn't a common occurrence because of the way citizenship went, and then you had to pay for slaves, and then if you, so if you had these like slave children, it was kind of just like another mouth to feed, so to speak. Right. It's one of the big differences in terms of the slave economy and how the slave owning worked in Rome. And, and again, I'm now really talking about Middle Republic later. Um, there's first of all, just so many slaves, so many more. So they were less valuable in that sense. You know, they were less of a, an investment for Romans. You could use them for more, less important roles. Um, also, Rome didn't have the same idea about purity in terms of citizenship. So freeing slaves and having them become citizens was very normal. And therefore, there wasn't a taboo against that. And in fact, homegrown slaves, that is, children who are born to slave mothers, was considered a good source of loyal slaves. There's a word for it, verna. Now, that could often mean that you'd made your slaves mate. They talked about breeding slaves. It's all horrible, of course. But so they did talk about that and also just allowing people to have relationships as slaves because their children would be more slaves. So it was great. It's like a free way of getting more slaves and that would be brought up in the house and loyal to their family. But also another way of doing that was to breed them yourself with your female slaves. Or if you felt like this was a good way of getting a wife and not having to do anything complicated, you could free the woman to do so. And that seemed to have happened quite a lot, a lot, who knows what that means, but you know, it was very common, especially below the upper classes. I wouldn't say the aristocracy was going around marrying freed women all that often. In fact, there were laws against that. But middle class and below, it seems to have been quite common. That is one of the arguments occasionally used to suggest that slavery wasn't such a bad thing at Rome sometimes, because look, so these women, you know, they got to be freed and marry their masters. Which is just a complete misunderstanding of sexual abuse. But anyway... <laughs> Wow, that's great. So you've been sexually abusing me for years and now you're going to free me on condition that I have to keep doing that and I'll be legally bound to you in a different way. Great. <laughs> Ancient mores are always tiny. Yeah. yeah. It's tough sometimes, you know. I mean, I love studying the ancient world, but sometimes you sort of think, why again? <laughs> You just have to disconnect yourself and say, like, there's a different time in a different place and you can't project backwards because you'll be like, these are just terrible people when for their time period, they were just everyone yeah. else. But at the same time, I think we can we can say that probably a lot of people were miserable a lot of the time. In other words, prostitution was quite similar at Greece and at Rome, but there was, you know, there were little things that were a bit different, I think. Another point that I just wanted to mention just quickly about the sort of different ways they thought about sexuality is the other big thing that the Romans thought the Greeks were very weird for. They were weird for pederasty and they were weird for all their public nudity. Um, the Romans were very more, the men in particular, were much more prudish about showing off their body. Now, they went to the public baths, you know, so they were naked in front of other men in what was sort of a private space. I know they were public baths. But if you see what I mean, that's an internal space. But they didn't do the naked athletics. And they really never got behind that. Uh, they liked to watch it sometimes. What did they, well, they wear then? do athletics. The Romans, really. Romans themselves, the citizens, trained for war. So they did military training. And when they did that, they would wear, you know, military uniforms. 
and occasionally might swim or play ball games at the baths and do a few other things like that. But they didn't go to gymnasiums. They didn't do athletics. They watched athletics when Greeks did them. Sometimes they, there were some athletic games imported to Rome, but the Romans really didn't ever do them. And they watched gladiators, but gladiators were slaves. They watched boxers, but boxers were slaves. So in other words, they would watch sports, <laughs> as we would think of it, but they didn't participate in it. And one of the things is that they did not like being on display for other people because that's effeminizing, that's giving pleasure to other people in the same way. You know, so dancing, again, like the Greeks were big into dancing. You learned to dance as a young man, and that was an upper class thing to do. Romans, something you could say against someone that he was too good at dancing. If he danced well, that was a very suspicious sign. And so they didn't dance, they didn't uh, perform. Remember, Romans weren't actors. Actors at Rome, again, were slaves and foreigners. There was no idea of a citizen actor like there was at Greece. So the idea of being on stage for other people to look at was very much something a lower class would do. You're an entertainer. You're catering to other people's bodily desires, even if that's just their desire to look at you. And therefore, it's shameful. The only time that they would expose their body in public, for instance, would be maybe in an oration if you wanted to show off what a good soldier where you were and you had a particularly impressive scar, you might bear some part of your body to show that bit of the scar. Show some ankle. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, a shoulder or even a thigh or something. But of course, only if it was on the front. You would never want to show a scar on your back because that meant you were running away. And the other thing you might have on your back would be whip marks. And those would be the marks that showed that you had either been beaten in the army for desertion or some other crime, or that you had been a slave and beaten as a slave. So marks on your back were a sign of disgrace. So those are just some interesting things about bodies that really make a difference between Greek and Roman concepts of sort of what was acceptable. That's interesting, but they enjoyed Greek statues tremendously, and they copied them, and then they were in the nude, so it, it seems to be a, an odd mix ah, the there. Great Roman conundrum about their attitudes towards Greece. Indeed, um, they did. They, they became enamored of Greek art. I mean, first of all, they just liked Greek statues. It's not that they minded naked bodies. They minded their own bodies being naked. So looking at statues of gods and things like that, that's just delighting the eye. That's great. <laughs> you know, you're getting pleasure from it, just like you should. Now, there are some very few nude statues of Roman men, of actual Roman men, heroic nudes, that you know, style of Greek heroic nudity. But there's not a lot. If you go and you look, you will see there's not a lot of them. It's quite uncommon. Mostly when they were real people, they were portrayed in clothing, and in particular in the toga or in military dress, one or the other, to highlight those roles of being a citizen. And so while in the Greek conception, you have this idea that a citizen is, is naked in art is actually sort of a mark of citizenship because he's participating in the gymnasium and athletics, or he's heroic. For the Romans, clothing and the particular type of clothing that you know had a lot of signifiers, like toga or uh, military garb or whatever, was what you had to wear in a statue because it showed that you were a particular kind of citizen. I didn't know that they didn't do gymnastics for some reason. Well, they did compete in the Olympics, though. Some did, yeah. So the Romans were always a bit of a paradox with their ideas about the Greeks. So on the one hand, Greeks were foreign and Eastern and effeminate and lazy and um, what else? Luxurious and weak. Insert adjective. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All these things, right? And they were a corrupting influence. On the other hand, they were also cultured, intellectual, the source of all learning, the best source of art, and the Romans felt a certain inferiority complex towards them. So they have this sort of dual <laughs> feeling about the Greeks. So when they competed in the Greek Olympics, because there were Romans that did that, did they compete in the nude to then? Be honest, I don't know. I assume they did whatever the custom was, but to be very honest, I don't know, because that's mostly later after Greece was province. I haven't actually looked into that. I'd be interested to know because I actually don't know. So what did happen was you had individual aristocrats and individual Hellenizing Romans who were very enamored of Greece and very into Greek things. But they might do those things when they were in Greece. And that was also a really important part of the Romans sort of when they weren't in Rome, 
they could do all sorts of things. So they have their villas down in the Bay of Naples where they do all sorts of things that they wouldn't do when they're in Rome. You can have, you know, when in Greece do as the Greeks do. Instead of when in Rome do as the Romans do, they take the opposite approach. <laughs> Both of those. When in Rome, they had to do as the Romans did. So in the city of Rome, you're not going to have many Roman citizens, upper class in particular, participating in any sorts of activities that were seen as shameful. When they go east, and that's where we come back to Julius Caesar and the King Nicomedes, when you're out east, eh, things are a little looser, right? You do what the things are appropriate there. When Pompey goes out east later on, Pompey the Great, and he fights and deals with Mithridates and various other things. But when he's putting those provinces in order, he acts like a king. He's luxurious. He does all sorts of things that if he did them at Rome, would have had everybody up in arms in seconds. But he can do it out east because, you know, I mean, all those Easterners, they're all used to people being all luxurious out there. So, you know, there's a, a kind of dualism to the way that the Romans thought. And you see that with Antony and Cleopatra, too. That's really important. When Antony's out in the court of Cleopatra, he's every inch the Oriental, and I use that in <laughs> the old-fashioned way of meaning anything that's east of Italy, <laughs> the Oriental despot, right? At least from what Augustus tells us he was doing, and he won the war, so he gets to do the propaganda. Um, Antony was acting like an Eastern king. So he was wearing gold and purple and sitting on thrones and being luxurious and doing all the things that were not very Roman. And it was okay, sort of, that he was doing that when he was there. You know, Caesar had done some of those things while he was there too, but he needed to come back to Rome and be a Roman man. And the problem was he didn't come back to Rome enough. Is that a big reason maybe like in the empire, you get a lot of the upper class Romans who really want to get the governorships in the eastern provinces because they can kind of let loose, so to speak? I think that's part of it. The other part of it is the eastern provinces were really rich. Oh, yeah, that too. <laughs> money and fun. Yeah, as opposed to in the West, the only way to get money really was by conquering places and getting a lot of slaves. Julius Caesar did and others in Gaul, you know, if you can enslave populations, you could sell those and get a lot of money. But there wasn't a lot of other money to be made because there weren't already cities and things. But in the East, they had a lot of money. So that was the other part of it. But yeah, absolutely. Going out and spending a year in the flesh pots of the Eastern Empire, you know, was, <laughs> was fun for Romans in a way that they didn't get to have at home. Because for all of these ideological things, I mean, Romans enjoyed themselves as much as anybody else. And you see that with the emperors too, of course. There are different rules. All of what I'm saying is one thing, but once you have empire, emperors, there are different rules. That doesn't mean the rules are completely gone. And if people don't like the emperor, they'll hold all of these activities against them and say, you're not being a proper Roman. But as long as you can keep people mostly on your side, you can pretty much do anything as an emperor. So things change. They're not fearful of uh, transgressing norms because they are the top dog, so to yeah. speak. But then as soon as you see, you know, when somebody goes out of favor or loses his position, that's when Suetonius is writing about all the horrible things that Tiberius did or Nero did or Caligula did or whatever, because that's how you blacken somebody's name. Oh, Suetonius. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's so much fun. <laughs> His biographies may not be the most accurate in the world, but boy, are they entertaining. <laughs> when I first got interested in ancient world in Rome, and that was one of the first few things I read, weirdly enough. <laughs> and apparently I stuck around. <laughs> oh, no, I think Suetonius is a great intro to the ancient world. <laughs> I always tell my students if they really want something entertaining, they need to read his life of Caligula. I mean, it's very amusing. Don't believe any of it, but it's great. And funny enough, for, so for Rome, it was Suetonius, and for Greece, it was Herodotus. So you basically get, like, the two national inquires of the ancient world. Yes. But they're also great <laughs> storytellers, so <laughs> that's the thing, right? So I think the last thing that I didn't haven't touched on and that we, should, we can perhaps end on is the phallus. So just like the Greeks, I mean, the Romans definitely saw the phallus as playing an important religious role, and shall we say, folkloric role, maybe, and also a, an important role in, in gender. So in some ways, they're very similar to the Greeks. Like you have the Herms in Greece that you've talked about in one of your episodes, which have these big phalluses. And you have a very similar figure in the figure of Priapus, who's at Rome. There are statues of the god Priapus, and he stands in 
at boundary markers and in gardens. He's particularly associated with gardens and agriculture, but like vegetable gardens, more even than like a large agricultural area. And he is a usually wooden statue, sort of roughly cut of a male figure with a very large upright phallus, usually painted red. And the kind of implied threat was that if you trespassed or tried to steal anything from the garden or the home, he would use that phallus on you. There's a whole genre called the Priapian poetry, which is written in the voice of Priapus or about Priapus. And a lot of it's love poetry, but there's also threats and invective. And uh, so Priapus has this role in poetry of um, teaching people how to seduce boys. In particular, that's his, his role. But there's also quite a few poems where he says, essentially, if you come in and try to steal anything, I'll punish you as is appropriate. For boys, I'll bugger you. For women, I'll rape you vaginally. And for men, I'll uh, rape you in the mouth. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't read these yet. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a later genre. It's a sort of subgenre of poetry. But yeah. And so we have this sort of idea that he stands um, with the, so the phallus is threatening, but it's also he's associated with gardens. So it's also about fertility, kind of a dual role. And it's used in that kind of a role. We also have the fasciness or the necklace that there was a kind of uh, good luck charm that Romans often wore around their neck, little boys and children. And it was a small phallus. And that was to ward off evil and specifically to ward off the evil eye. And then we have lots and lots of drawings of and statues of and other representations of phalluses in uh, the ancient world. And of the fame, you know, some of the famous ones and absolutely my favorite are things like wind chimes and other ornaments. Usually it's a phallus, two little balls hanging off of it. And uh, so the best ones are the ones with feet and wings. And one of my favorites is one which it's a phallus with feet and wings, but the phallus has a phallus <laughs> as well <laughs> in between his little feet. <laughs> Just a little one. When I visited Naples for the first time, and I was not expecting that. And I was blown away when I walked into that room. I was like 20 and I was a student. And I hadn't seen it before. I walked in. I was like, first thing I saw was the that the famous statue of Pan and the, making love to the goat. And then I saw all these wind chimes. And I was just like, what is this? <laughs> oh, I, <see. laughs> I know. They're, I mean, they're amazing. There's another one. Remind me later. And I'll send you a link if you can't find the picture of it because you could put it up. It's a little bronze statue that it's a man wearing a cloak. So he's like very cloaked and hooded. But the cloak part comes off. And when you take it off, it's just, it's just, just a big dick. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you're removing essentially like the foreskin or something, the cloak. Did you see the picture? Yeah, I, I was laughing. I don't know if you heard me uh, <laughs> while you were talking. I was trying to cover it, so I didn't bother you. But I don't remember seeing that, and I'm kind of bummed out that I didn't. <laughs> no, that's like, isn't it amazing? <laughs> He's like a little. It's like a little um, Christmas ornament, and then all of a sudden, it's a. <laughs> he looks like a little <laughs> Christmas man. <laughs> It's like something you'd have on your tree. No, and you take off his cloak and it's just it's this, this penis with fully realized human legs. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing I have ever seen. I mean, that and the and the wind chimes are just like some of my favorite things in the entire world. And I was swear if there were no other reward to having become a professor in an ancient studies department, the fact that I get to show that to classes is almost reward enough. <laughs> I'm curious as to what their responses are. Well, shocked <laughs> laughter, obviously. <laughs> Lots of giggling. Probably similar to my response when I walked into Naples. <laughs> I mean, I usually give them some warning that something is coming, that it's going to be. And trust me, after about a, a class and a half with me, you know that I'm not going to be good at being polite in a whole bunch of different ways. <laughs> and that I'm um, not massively restrained. So my students are usually pretty aware of that early on. But yeah, it always evokes off lots and lots of laughter. So did Pris and like these phallic statues of him or figurines or however size they were, were they kind of like the Roman version of Herms then? To some extent, but I think the Priapus statues were somewhat like Herms. Um, and, you know, they, you'd do a little sacrifice to them so that it would watch over your garden. 
they didn't have the same civic function quite the same. You know, the Hermes become really important to the city as a whole in a way that the statues of Priapus don't at Rome, to my knowledge. So they're not quite as the same role. But they were kind of good luck charms in many ways. So you have like in Pompeii, you see just phalluses, you know, drawn onto walls or carved onto doorsteps and things like that. And one of the things that people talk about is that they were, I think, often meant to evoke laughter. They were meant to be funny. I mean, you look at these Priapus wind chimes, they're clearly not meant to be erotic, right? There's nothing sexy about them. Far from it. I mean, for some people, maybe. Uh. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's your case. I'm not shaming you yeah. here. But there's big statues of Priapus, like the famous wall painting of him weighing his phallus in a set of scales. Huge phallus. Like, it's clearly not meant to be sexy. It's meant to be funny. And one of the reasons for that is that laughter drives away evil spirits, and laughter drives away bad luck, and laughter drives away the evil eye. So there seems to be part of it. It was just that, you know, unexpected penises made you laugh. <laughs> and so then it was good. The other thing that's different, though, between the Romans and the Greeks. So first of all, I just think there's even more phalluses in Rome than there are in Greece, <laughs> which is saying something on sort of on display. The other thing is because you don't have the public nudity and the statues, we don't really have a comparison exactly, but you know how on the Greek statues, they have very small genitalia, you know, that's considered attractive and good and moderate. We don't really have an equivalent, like we can't say that the Romans didn't think that was good or did think that was good. They just didn't talk about it. They didn't talk about what a man looked like in a respectable way. Because it didn't matter. I mean, the pleasure well, was theirs, that's right? part of it. And I think also because they weren't like, you couldn't just wander around judging a man on the size of his junk because he wasn't on display. And anyway, you weren't supposed to be looking at citizen boys that way. So it just isn't discussed in the same way. But, and it's not in statues because mostly of real people anyway, we don't have Romans uh, in the nude. But I will say that there is very much a sort of aggressive masculinity that is portrayed by large penises and large phalluses and the idea of using it in an aggressive and violent way against other men in particular, not so much against women uh, because you're obviously dominant against women. You don't need to show that off, but against men, there's this sort of, again, a type of invective and a type of poetry that is all about threatening other men with rape. And that is a standard like Catullus has it and Marshall has it and Horace has it. And so in that sense, they don't specifically say how big they are, but obviously it's a different ideal. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And then we do have some poetry talking about how women particularly liked big men and that this is what they look for in the gladiators and other slaves that they like. But again, we get that in satire. So you know, it's a little hard to unpack exactly what that means. So I think that's the one slight difference in terms of ideal bodies from Greece to Rome. And the way that it's used as a tool, shall I say, of aggression in Rome in a way that it isn't on display in the same way in Greece. So in literature, they basically are threatening to rape you with like their large penises. Yeah. I will read you a poem by Catullus and I will... Shall I say, warning to anyone who's listening, this is very explicit. Um, so Catullus 16, which is a poem about poetry. He's writing to people who are elsewhere in his poems considered friends. And he's saying, you don't interpret my poems correctly. You think I'm not really a man. I'll show you how much of a man I am. So it goes, I'll fuck you in the ass and I'll fuck you in the face. Aurelius the Pathic and Sodomite Furious, who thought you knew me for my verses, since they're erotic, not modest enough. It suits the poet himself to be dutifully chaste, his verses not necessarily so at all, which in short then have wit and good taste, even if they're erotic, not modest enough, and as for that can incite to lust. I don't speak to boys, but to hairy ones who can't move their stiff loins. You who read all these thousand kisses, you think I'm less of a man? I'll fuck you in the face and I'll fuck you in the ass. So when I took Catullus in undergrad, we did not read those poems at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't have me. <laughs> That's your teacher. I know, neither did I. When I did Catullus in undergrad, we skipped all the dirty poems. And even the ones we did read that had possible dirty interpretations, my prof was very uh, not going to discuss those possible readings. We basically read the most boring Catullus poems that you could probably pick. 
not the ones that are like very much like hip and ax. <laughs> Here's another one that you didn't read of Catullus. Aurelius, father of hungers, you desire to fuck not just these, but whoever my friends were or are or will be in future years, not secretly. Now, at the same time as you joke with one, you try clinging to him on every side in vain. Now my insidious cock will bugger you first. And if you're filled, I'll say nothing. Now I'm grieving for him. You teach my boy, mine, to hunger and thirst. So lay off while you've any shame or you will end up being buggered. So that differs quite a bit from the, uh, say, the Greek love poetry that we get. (laughs) Capellus has some other poems that are actually what we would consider love poems, too. But he has a whole bunch of poems which are what we'd call performative masculinity, where he's performing the role of aggressive male. Now, does that mean that this was an actual threat he would carry out on anyone? Almost certainly not. And, I mean, you can immediately find the equivalents in modern invective, the things you say to somebody. We kind of have forgotten that sometimes saying, you know, well, fuck you, means that, if you think about it. And the fact that a woman could say it to a man or whatever, like, we've kind of, it's sort of a dead metaphor in some ways now. But there's there's a whole part of the internet that will respond to any woman they don't like with threats of performative masculinity. Uh, I like to think that most of those are not actually literal, but on the other hand, who knows? And I'm not saying it was never done literally either, but this idea that the sort of masculine aggression and dominance can be portrayed in this sexual terms is uh, very big at Rome. And again, against men, not against women, because you might say you would like to have sex with a woman to woo her, but it's not the same sort of threat because there's just no point to that relationship. So I guess this can be my last question. I remember when I was an undergrad, I read Ovid and his Ars Amatory and things like that. So it kind of seems like that's kind of at odds with the Roman ideal, where it's like you have this poetry from Ovid who's telling you how to woo women, and then at the same time, it's Roman sexuality is kind of just like, it doesn't matter what the other one feels. Well, so that's, no, that's a very good point. The Roman love poetry, sort of in Catullus, he does this too in, in other poems, not like the one I just read, but mostly in the ones who follow him, Propertius, Tibullus, and then Ovid, and they're the ones we call the Roman love elegists, and they write love poetry to women and, and to boys. In those, they are very explicitly being anti-Roman and anti-manly. So they are saying specifically, I am unmanned. They call their mistress, it's where we get the term mistress originally, they call her domina, which means mistress of slaves. They, at, they say, I'm enslaved, I'm like a slave, I'm tortured by you like slaves are tortured. I can't write epic. I can only write love poetry because I'm just not manly enough to write epic. I don't want to go off and be a soldier. Soldiering's too hard. I'm soft and weak and lazy. And so there's this complete inversion. Some people have argued, and I would argue it's not complete, but that's a, <laughs> that's a discussion for another time. But on the face of it, anyway, it's a complete inversion of standard masculine roles. You have an active woman and a passive man. You have an unmanly man who has been unmanned by his desire to be in love. And the whole idea of being in love with a woman who has the choice of whether or not to reciprocate is not part of the standard dynamics of heterosexual relations. And so that is, you know, that's a major part of the point of Roman love poetry is this, and in order for it to function the way it does, it has to be held against the standard ideology of masculinity in Rome. This is part of what is happening at the end of the Republic. Ideals and are being tested and and fought against in various ways and undermined. So the ideology of, say, the upper class male sexuality, do we, with this poetry, is, is there a reason we have so much because it was abnormal? Or was this kind of how like everyday people felt in terms of the relationships and it, it wasn't the ideal from, for the upper class, but it was kind of how like the normal everyday person would have kind of pursued their type of relationships or their love interests or... Is it just abnormal? <laughs> Let us put this way. I don't think what we're seeing in the love poetry of the upper class people who are writing it because they are upper class. I don't think we're seeing a reflection of lower class habits. Put it that way. I think the middle and lower class would be, they don't have the leisure to lie around on people's doorsteps weeping because their girlfriend won't let them in. 
you know, this is still an aristocratic way of thinking and acting. It's partly comes out of Greek and it comes out of Greek comedy and stuff like that. So this is Greek too. All of Roman literature is also Greek. So that's part of it. Now, there's also great dispute about whether any of these poets actually did any of the things they say they do in their poetry. So just because they say they lie about moaning over women that they love who don't love them doesn't mean they necessarily ever did. The girls that they talk about are all have pseudonyms. They're not real people, or maybe they were, but they're anonymous to us now. So actually, that's a big point of dispute. Um, Ovid's girlfriends, for instance, are almost certainly completely made up. They're just literary fictions. Uh, he says in the very first poem of his, his love poems, he says, Cupid hit me with a, an arrow and said, you're going to be a lover. And I said to Cupid, but I can't. I don't have anyone I'm in love with. And he said, oh, well, we'll go find you one of those. But you're going to be a love poet. And then he says, well, I can't be a love poet because I don't have anyone to fall in love with. And so Cupid says, OK, we'll find you someone to fall in love with. So, you know, the literary pose of wanting to write love poetry comes first. Then you find somebody to be in love with so you can write the poems. So making up relationships started with the Romans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> at least. At least. <laughs> my, you know my girlfriend? She lives in Canada, but... <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I don't know. Um, I think the transgressive nature of the poetry was part of its appeal, certainly. But I think it's very hard to know whether to take it as an indication of real life. It's so literary. And, you know, as with many of these things, I think we're kind of left in the dark a bit. Comedy, I guess, would be more of a, I guess you could kind of see more everyday instances. But even then, it's you have the, the upper class male falling haplessly in love for, with a prostitute or something yeah. like that. And on the one hand, maybe that means it happened. On the other hand, maybe that's just because if you're going to betray it on the stage, what is he going to do? Fall in love with the cloistered girl next door he's never seen? That's not going to get you very far. So the only person he can ever see and fall in love with is a prostitute, you know? So I don't know. It's uh, one of the incessant problems is that we can't, really ever know what kind of reality is mediated by our texts the frustrating and the fascinating thing at the same time and that's going to wrap it up today uh this was an excellent discussion i feel like i learned a lot about romans and i want to learn more so uh, hopefully we'll have uh, avon back on uh in the future for possibly another topic um if you guys haven't checked out her podcast yet it is The Endless Knot. Definitely do it. She has some great episodes up there right now. She's in the middle of a series on race and racism in the ancient world, and it's fantastic. So definitely check that out. Even where can everybody uh, find you on social media or your podcast at? Well, you can go to alliterative.net and find our podcast there. And you can also find videos that my husband and I do on language and etymology if you're interested in that. And you can find me on Twitter at Avon Sarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And those are probably the best places to find us. You can also look for Endless Knot on Facebook. What is that? Is I think it's Facebook, the Endless Knot YouTube channel. Try that. <laughs> Something like that anyway. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm always happy to talk about any of these subjects on uh, Twitter or elsewhere. And thanks so much for having me on, Ryan. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.